The Paul Report goes on the road for this episode. Your traditional farm may house some cows and chickens, but at KF Acres in Decatur, sheep are the livestock of choice. Sheep were domesticated 10,000 years ago. In fact, President Woodrow Wilson grazed sheep on the White House lawn. So come with us on the farm for all things sheep. The Paul Report starts now. Production of The Paul Report is brought to you by... Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of The Paul Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Well, this episode of the Paul Report, we go on location to KF Acres Farm in Decatur, Illinois, and we're joined by Jody Cabot, who has been raising sheep probably all of your life or near all of your life. And so, my, you know, let's start there. Why sheep? How did you get started in this? I was five years old and my mom joined a, a wool spinning fiber guild in town and brought home some sheep and said, here, take care of them and these will make a good 4-H project for you in another couple years and it kind of went from there. How did you, I mean, how do you learn the process? How do you learn the animal? How did you, you know, I, I guess they're not intimidating when you first see them, but they are larger animals, so how did you kind of learn the trade? Trial and error. Um, I spent a lot of time with a lot of older people um, watching and learning. Um, spent a a lot of time on the road at people's houses and farms and at shows and sales and basically um, always trying to learn something without necessarily asking questions was was kind of my mentality mm -hmm. and, and the, the purpose of which I did. And studied the animal. Study the animal. I, I spent some time on a livestock judging team when I was in, when I was in 4-H age. Um, learned about three or four different species of beef and the swine and the sheep and the and the goats but primarily I focused most of my efforts on the sheep because that's what I had. Um, I, I don't really know why I kind of went towards them uh, but but I always kind of gravitated to them. I grew up on a dairy farm and, and we had beef cows and we've had pigs and we've had a little bit of ev everything but I don't I can't explain why it was always being drawn to the sheep. Are sheep farms unique? I, I mean, I just have to say, I'm not that I'm a city girl, but uh, are they unique in, in this part of the country? I wouldn't say so. There's a lot of sheep. If, if you went um, within an hour of here, you could probably find, and we actually did a, a small count, and, and there's probably 25 or 30 sheep flocks within an hour of, of this place that are competitive um, in terms of showing and raising sheep. Plus the many others that I don't know about that are that are just geared for wool or fiber production or or meat production or whatever their individual intents are so um, while while I would say that they're not unique they're the same as every other farm in terms of grass and fence and barns and livestock um, that here in the in the Midwest in the Corn Belt region that sheep flocks are smaller uh, most of them are probably 20 to 40 head opposed to being out west on the range where there might be 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 head. I want to know the characteristics of a sheep. I, you know, again, coming from somebody that grew up with dogs and cats, not, not sheep, what are these animals like? What's their, uniquely, what's their tick? Um, uniquely, sheep are, are, they have the ability to convert a roughage and inedible product for people in terms of grass and hay. And, and they can convert that into three byproducts, we'll say, in terms of meat, in terms of wool, and in terms of milk. Uh, milk is, is ever-growing, not a, not a large facet of the sheep industry because you've got dairy goats and dairy cattle to provide the milk that most people need. But, but, but sheep um, probably make up 95 plus percent of the fiber industry that, that is homegrown here in the U.S. 
Um, and then the meat's ever growing too. So they're, they're one of the rare species that can come up with three, three products. What's their personality like? Are they smart? Drastically different from <laughs> animal to animal. Um, really? Some, some animals and, and even from breed to breed, but more so animal to animal. Some are, are extremely tame and, and friendly and will walk up to you out in the pen and, and you can sit there and pet them and rub them and scratch them and whatever else. And, and others uh, see a person and, and, and want nothing to do with you. Um, very, it, it depends on, on how they're up brought. Um, it depends on how much time you spend with them from a baby onward. Um, but, but still very, very different from animal to animal. What is their origin? I know that they travel in a group or a flock, flock if you would call yep. it. Why is it. Why is it that instinct? Is it a, to protect themselves? I mean, from way back when, from, from wolves or from coyotes or whatever it might be? For the most part, yes. Sheep are a prey animal and, and they have that, that natural, what's called flocking instinct to them. And, 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 and so, you know, if you take one sheep by itself, you got one pair of eyes to look out. If you take a hundred sheep by themselves, you got 200 pairs of eyes to look out, or a hundred pairs, 200 eyes looking out and, and looking in every direction. So um, they, they kind of flock together. Uh, you can see them when they're grazing. Rarely will, will a group of ewes be too many feet apart. They'll always be pretty close together. Can you talk about the different breeds and then once once we kind of go over that I'd like for you to explain the kind of sheep that you have here but there it's my understanding that there are more breeds of sheep than any other livestock I think so um, I think there's two or three hundred different breeds uh, sheep are basically divided into three types there's meat sheep there's wool sheep and there's hair sheep and um, of, of the different wool type sheep, there's fine wools and there's medium wools and there's coarse wools. Predominantly the medium wool sheep are the meat sheep. The fine wool sheep and the coarse wool sheep um, are, the, are the more fiber oriented fleece type sheep. Um, and then there's the hair sheep, which, which may either grow wool and shed it or just be hair sheep. Um, here we raise Oxfords, which are a medium wool sheep. They're a white bodied, uh, dark faced, um, big frame type of an animal, kind of a dual purpose in terms of selling some wool off of them, but also being primarily geared for a meat type production. Um, our other breed is, is what we call natural colored. It's a relatively new, uh, more so a classification than a breed. Um, the, the, according to our associations, to be natural colored, it's 30% of the body, excluding the face and legs, has to be some color other than white. Okay. And uh, the natural colored sheep are a fleece breed, so we do put a lot of emphasis in our genetic selection on fleeces. Um, some are fine wool, some are medium wool. We don't have any coarse wooled sheep, which are, which are kind of a curly wool sheep. Their wool actually kind of grows in locks. Um, we don't have any of those, but, but they're out there too. And you said you have Oxford sheep here. What is the characteristic? You said they're big. Oxfords are big sheep. They're meaty sheep. They're white bodied, dark faced. Um, more so meat oriented. Um, our natural colored sheep may have, they're predominantly Columbia blood. Um, they have some Cordale in them, they have some Dorset in them, um, they have some Rambouillet in them, which are also all big wool sheep. Um, but again, kind of, kind of similarly built. All sheep that we pick are, are kind of big framed, heavy muscled, um, growthy type of sheep because of the show ring is our primary emphasis goal. Um, but uh, they're, the natural colors are, are a little more fleece oriented than the Oxfords. The Oxfords, we don't, we don't use fleece at all for any genetic selection. You know, I, I suppose, and this is just my, my ignorance, not growing up around sheep, that I thought that they were all white. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. They're, they, they grow other colors, or they, they is that, if that's the right term, they're not just all white sheep. That's right. There, there's, there's a lot of color variation between breeds. Um, some breeds are red, like a Tunis. They have red faces, red hmm. feet. Um, some breeds are, are, are black, like our natural colored sheep, or they may be spotted, um, like a chocolate chip cookie pattern. Um, some breeds are, are what they call moret, which is kind of a brown and white color. Uh, there's, there's brown ones, and, and there's a lot of different color variations. Um, and the different color variations typically 
appeal to two types of people. The show ring type of people that like that color for lots of flash and eye appeal and, and to really stand out in the ring, but it also appeals to the fleece people in terms of, of having some really good color palettes to choose from to make that yarn without having to dye and blend and, and do a bunch of other things to the fleece. Take me around the day in the life of your farm here, of KF Acres. Um, through most of the year, it's pretty easy and simple. Do chores in the morning, um, maybe have some odds and end projects to do and, and go to work or something. And in, in, in the weekends, um, we'll, we'll spend time deworming sheep or, or trimming feed or whatever we need to do and catch up on the weekends. Uh, the bulk of our time in our lives is spent with the sheep in lambing season in January. And that may mean waking up at four o'clock in the morning to go out and put two or three hours in before we got to leave to go to work. Um, get home that night, head straight to the barn to take care of a bottle lamb or, or, or make sure that there's no babies being born or something that needs to get nursed. Um, and we might be out in the barn until 10 or 11 at night that night. And, uh, and then one of us will wake up at two o'clock in the morning and go out and check on bottle lambs or, or, or check on ewes, make sure nobody's having lambs. And, um, and so during lambing season in particular, sleep is pretty limited around here. Um, we try to rotate as much as we can because after a while you kind of get tired and, and ready for some, for some rest. But um, average day, chores in the morning, um, do kind of go to work and, and come home that night and do chores again. It's, it's pretty simple most of the year. Um, raising sheep is, is not, it's not that complicated as long as they got feed and water and, and shelter and, and kind of somebody to watch over them, they're, they're going to thrive. And also after lambing season, there's also when you have to shear them. Is that a once a year, twice a year? When, when do you shear your sheep? The bulk of our sheep will shear in December, right before lambing season. Um, because we, our goal is to take the wool off of them to better increase lamb survivability. Um, if, if a ewe has a big six inch long bulky fleece on her, she's not going to feel that baby lamb. She may lay on it, she may smash it. The other thing is she's not going to feel the weather elements. Um, so she may lay down in a snow drift and have a baby lamb um, in, in January or February and the chances of that lamb surviving are probably not very good. So by shearing the ewes, they're actually exposed to the weather and therefore whenever it's time to have a lamb, they spend most of their time in the barn, the lambs are born in a barn and, and they're off and, and run into a good start. Um, the other thing is from a fiber production standpoint, having, having lambs and, and going through that process of life is extremely stressful and, um, and it'll actually cause what's called a wool break which is, a, which is a brittle spot in the fleece. So if you shear your sheep right before lambing, you don't have the wool break as opposed to you shear your sheep like six months before they're lambing, then, you're, then your fleece, you're actually causing a weak spot halfway in the middle of your fleece growing cycle. How long does it take to shear them? And then once you shear them, what happens next? Professionally, sheep, sheep shearers may fly through a sheep a minute, a sh two sheep every minute. Um, so people just people zoom. shear. It's just a... I got friends that, that tell me they shear three or four hundred a day. Um, oh me, I shear my own. It might take five minutes to do them. The other thing is, is, is these sheep are considerably bigger than a lot of your, a lot of your range type sheep, which are smaller. So obviously, if they're bigger, they take more time. I don't get in a hurry. Um, I take my time and try to make the wool as, as good of a clean cut as I can. And uh, so it might take five minutes, it might take 10 minutes, just depends on how big the ewe is and how big of a hurry I'm in. If it's a ram, it might take me longer because they're bigger and, and more stubborn. Are they bothered by that, that process? No, most of the time when, when, when we shear sheep on a, on a real scale, um, you, you flip them over and you'll sit them on their butt and there's an actual technique to shear them and, um, and they just basically sit there. Uh, they, don't, they don't move, they don't kick, they don't jump, it doesn't hurt them. It's, it's no different than, than me going and, and sitting in a barber's chair and getting my hair cut. I, you know, I, I'm there for a reason and, and a lot of times the sheep know. Whenever it starts getting hot and, and they're ready, um, in, in most operations it's spring shear or summer shear, the sheep know and they're ready to get it off of them. And, um, 
And, and most of the time they just sit there and, and when they're done, they get up and move on about your life. <laughs> but I heard don't turn them over because they can't get up. For, if they're laying on their back, that's a bad thing. <laughs> some, some may be that way. <laughs> you um, have a little story and, about and that's that. Kinda, that's kind of how they are. You know, there'll be times when I'll be sharing a sheep and, and, I'll, and I'll think, man, this sheep hasn't moved in a while. And I'll look at it and, and maybe I'll, I'll look its eye or flip its ear or something and it'll blink its eye. And I'll think, oof, good, it's still alive. I, I kind of worried because um, they really just sit there and, and don't move and, and it's like a, um, a spa and a, and a massage maybe to them. I don't, I don't know, but, but they do really, they just sit there. Huh. Let's talk about the wool. You know, that's an interesting process and you said that you've been doing some research on, on wool and wool products and dyeing. What have you discovered in, in your research over the years of, you know, once you shear the sheep and it's bagged and it's sent off to, to where, wherever it may go? Um, it, it's an ever-growing industry. There's lots and lots of more people trying to make their own fibers and yarns and, and creations from, from artwork even. Um, really gaining a lot of ground. I, I never, I never envisioned it prior to about a year and a half ago of, of how much of a demand there was for fiber. Um, this past winter, we sold 25 or 30 fleeces. Um, we advertised them on Facebook and we shipped them out probably to 15 different states um, in, in boxes and, and the people bought a whole fleece or half a fleece raw right off the sheep. And, um, and you go through the time and we skirt it, which is to remove the the non-desirable fibers and fleeces and the dirty wools and the heavy grease wools and, and then we ship a nice clean good product to, a, to somebody that wants to do something with it and um, and then once they get it you know each person that I sell wool to I ask uh, what are you gonna make with this and, and it's interesting you know some will make yarns and and some will make um, gloves and socks and 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 artwork and and it's it's really interesting to me the different versatility that that wool has for people um, you know, historically speaking, a lot of sheep were white fleeced and, and they want white fleeces not just for white yarns but for dyeing and coloring too. And um, the, the really interesting thing to me is a lot of these natural colored sheep, these gray sheep and these silver ones, uh, these spotted ones in particular, they hold dye and, and so much better and make much more vibrant colors than the white does. Um, and it's easier to dye them to get those colors. and and it's been really an eye opener for me in the, in the different, in the demand of it, just the sheer demand of fiber and fleece. When you talk about the fleece, when you show them, and you do a lot of that, you, you spend about every weekend going and, and, and to different shows. What, I guess take me through that process. You know, what does a judge look for in, in a, you know, a, a contestant in, in a show like this? If it's a ewe or if it's a steer or if it's a lamb, is, is it the coat? Is it the color? Is it the body build? Is it the face? You know, I think of dogs, you know, when they're in the show ring, but I'm sure it's a little different when it comes to sheep. So take me through that process. Each breed has what's called a, a, a scorecard or a standards of excellence. And so they'll, they'll take, depending on the breed, they'll assert a certain percentage of, of a points of, uh, based out of 100 as to whether they feel that body conformation is more important than fleece. Um, most of the meat breed sheep are judged strictly on body conformation. The more structurally correct, the heavier muscled, um, the bigger framed, whatever, whatever is important in a body conformation um, is what picks the best sheep to win, whether that's in a show or a sale, and that's what the buyers are gonna choose if we do go to a sale. Um, in the wool sheep, they'll put emphasis on the fleeces. Some breeds might put emphasis 50% on fleeces, 50% on body conformation. Other breeds might put emphasis 25 or 30% on fleece and, and 75 or 70% on body conformation. So it just depends. Depends on your breed, depends on your goal. If, if you're going to a show or a sale, um, you might trim that sheep a little bit different and by trimming them, you know, we put them up on a trimming stand um, or a blocking stand, something to that effect, and we shape the wool on the body to make that sheep look like a perfect specimen. Um, so, the, so the fleece uh, is actually gonna be um, different lengths. It may be shorter on the, front, on the front shoulder and it may be longer on the butt of the sheep uh, just because we're trying to make that sheep look perfect. And, uh, and, and by perfect, you know, it's, it's just like a dog show or a beauty pageant. This is, this is nothing more than that. Um, 
we're taking taking something from the pasture that just looks like a sheep and we're trying to turn we might wash it make it make it uh, snow white and and take it in if it's that type of a breed um basically that's what i was going to ask is i know you have a lot of head of sheep here do you bathe them i mean how do you how do you take care of the wool to make sure it's just pristine um we do. Our Oxfords are a clean breed of sheep. They're a meat sheep, so wool is irrelevant in the show ring. So they will get washed before we take them to a show or to a sale. Um, we'll, we'll put them up. There's, there's a couple different ways. One is put them on a stand and wash them with a hose and Dawn soap. The other one, if we've got a bunch of them, will be to put them in tanks and wash them. Um, and, and so they're washed before they take and when we take those into the ring um, they're going to be white. Not, not bleached white, but they're going to be extremely snow white. Um, we haul a lot of sheep for a lot of other people. We trim a lot of sheep for a lot of other people. And the bulk of those are also washed sheep. Um, we get paid very well to, to do that for other people. And sometimes the people will wash them themselves and sometimes we'll wash them. Um, but in almost every case, the sheep will arrive here and we'll do all the cutout work and the trimming work and the, and the actual preparation for the show or the sale. And then we'll even haul that animal to that show on that sale for people and, and to show them and sell them. And basically the, the, the producer and the owner of the sheep doesn't ever have to leave home. Um, and, and any more online sales and, and online viewing of public auctions is more and more popular. So, so our people are, are sending me a text message as we're standing in the ring. Hey, you know, fix the back legs or, or the sheep looks good. And, um, and that's kind of fun too, that they can sit at home and do that and trust us with their animal. And, and it's kind of enjoying for us that people actually do trust us, so. You know, just like dogs and cats, they make good pets. What about sheep? Uh, you know, just they... It just depends. Sheep obviously take a lot of space. They take some grass, they take some feed. Um, they're, they're gonna be a little more high maintenance uh, because you've got to shear them at least once a year. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're prone to, to some diseases or some problems or, or depending on the weather, that type of thing. If you want to raise them, you got to lamb them out, you got to breed them, you got to vaccinate them, you got to keep them healthy. Um, in terms of, of a person that likes livestock and wants to add sheep to their operation, yeah, they'll probably make a great pet. They're definitely smaller and more docile than a, than a horse or a cow. Um, definitely cleaner and, and easier to look at and, and more appealing to be around than a pig or, a, or anything to that effect. They're certainly easier to keep in a pen than a goat. Um, so from that avenue, um, they're pretty advantageous. <laughs> As we, um, you know, we've got a couple minutes left here in, in our talk today. I want to know a funny story that you might have about lambing or shearing or maybe your first sheep. What's the most memorable story that you can think of in all of your years doing this that you've had uh, with these animals? Oh, I don't know. Um, there's so many stories. I, I don't know if we can come up with a with the most memorable. Um, probably one that would stick out, particularly if you asked my parents, is the very first time I showed one, um, and uh, and and I didn't want to go out there. You know, I was eight, and I was in 4-H, and I was scared. And and they basically said push, and they pushed me out, and said don't let go, or everybody's gonna laugh at you. And uh, and it all kind of started from there. You know, um, the other. The other kind of memorable story is when I met my wife and, and um, I, was, I had called her, she was a sheep superintendent at a county fair and I had called her and wanted to know about coming to the fair to show and, and didn't know anything at the time and I wasn't actually going to go to it and, and uh, she practically called me and begged me and, and wanted me to come because her other people backed out and, and look where that ended up and got us today. <laughs> on this beautiful farm, yeah. on this beautiful farm. Yeah, it's farm. been a lot of work but, but we're trying to make it look good. Absolutely. Well, Jody, thank you so much for inviting the Paul Report to come out and see your, your beautiful animals and for spending some time with us uh, on, this, on this great day yeah. and talking about some great animals. Oh, so we, thank appre you so we appreciate much. coming out. It, it means a lot to us, you know, and, and um, in both of our jobs, we, we try to educate the public as much as we can. So, so hopefully you learned something. I did. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for going on the road with us here on the Paul Report. We'll see you next time.
If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. Did you know full episodes of The Paul Report are on YouTube? They can be accessed at youtube.com slash weiutv. Then just go to The Paul Report playlist and select the episode you want to see. More information about the show is also available 24-7 on our website at weiu.net under the television tab. Production of The Paul Report is brought to you by... Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foot remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support The Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of The Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston.